2,249 were unaccompanied children and 40,385 were family unit aliens, representing 62% of all enforcement actions. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Hastings for the Border Patrol's perspective. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Well, good afternoon. My name is Brian Hastings. I'm the Chief of Operations here at Border Patrol Headquarters. I think shortly you're going to see some videos here. This kind of outlines a few of the things that we have going on currently with the border. Specifically, these are taken of some large groups uh, in the El Paso area as well as Lordsburg, New Mexico. I'll talk about some of the challenges that that presents here shortly. Just kind of want to hit on a few of the things that uh, AC Meehan already mentioned. Primarily, 28 days in February, we had over 66,000 apprehensions. Um, during this fiscal year so far to date, since October, we've had over 20, 268,000 apprehensions so far, as compared to the same time frame last fiscal year. That's a 97% increase. So. A lot of folks look at that and they say, frankly, based upon those numbers, we have seen numbers like that in the past. In fact, if you look back to 2005, we've seen numbers 1.5 million. And so a lot of folks don't understand that the significant change in the demographics of what we're seeing today is what presents us and our partners with a lot of challenges. Historically, the U.S. Border Patrol has arrested 70 to 90 percent uh, Mexican nationals. We could apply a consequence to that demographic. We could return them quickly to Mexico. Today, 70% of all those we're arresting are from the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. October 2018 marked the first time in our history that family units exceeded single adult apprehensions. And in February of 2019, family units and unaccompanied children accounted for 65% of all Border Patrol apprehensions. For the fiscal year, it's 60% family unit apprehensions, family unit and unaccompanied juveniles. So without a consequence, without being able to deliver a consequence to these individuals for illegally crossing our borders, uh, the Border Patrol has no reason to expect that this trend will decrease. In fact, we believe it will increase. It's well known at this time that adults with children will not be detained during the immigration proceedings for illegal entry. The word of mouth and social media quickly gets back to those in the Northern Triangle countries that if you bring a child, you'll be successful. From April of 2018 through February of 2019, we've had almost 2,400 fraudulent claims of families. Of those fraudulent claims, some are folks who have claimed that they're under 18 and are not. Others have actually been fraudulent familial claims. Another trend that we're seeing, and I mentioned earlier, are the large groups. This is a dangerous trend for us. We define large group as a group over 100. Um, those groups so far this fiscal year, we've seen 70 of those groups, over 100. Um, they've totaled over 12,000 apprehensions. And the important thing to note is if you look back historically, last fiscal year we had 13 of those groups over 100. The year before that, two fiscal groups, or two groups over 100 for that fiscal year of 17. So that's 99% of all of those individuals are family units, again, and they are from, again, the Northern Triangle. If the current trend continues, Border, Border Patrol can expect to apprehend approximately 174 large groups, totaling over 29,000 deportable aliens. Now, the issue with this and the concern with, that with this that we have are the majority of these groups are entering in places that are very rugged, very remote, specifically talking two areas, Ajo, Arizona, Lordsburg, New Mexico, very remote, very rugged. The issue that that causes us, the challenge that causes us, is they're the furthest areas from our central processing centers, the furthest areas from medical services, furthest from our transportation services that we have as well. Um, current, even more troubling for us, is that the current intelligence is telling us, and we're seeing firsthand, the drug trafficking organizations are utilizing these groups as cover and diversion uh, to divert our agents away from the security, national security border mission 
and use them as a diversion to cross drug loads. We've had four, four specific cases here recently um, that we've seen those family units being used as a diversionary tactic. Um, that's con highly concerning for us going forward. So lastly, just want to hit on some of the resourcing issues that all of this causes for U.S. Border Patrol, CBP. We're devoting a, a large um, amount of our daily resources to this. Um, the facilities and the manpower cannot support the continued increase in the apprehensions of family units and unaccompanied children. Our Border Patrol stations were built in the 80s and 90s. They were built for a different demographic, not for the current amount of family units and UACs that we're seeing. And each day, each and every day, Border Patrol is putting approximately 25 to 40 percent of our manpower is being dedicated to the care, uh, transportation, and the humanitarian mission. They're pulled from the national security mission to do these things. We're committed to addressing these humanitarian need, but the current situation is unsustainable for Border Patrol operations. With this, the, the increased flow, the combined with the stress of the journey, the crowded conveyances, and flu season has resulted in significant increases for the medical referrals for Border Patrol. Currently, U.S. Border Patrol is sending an average of 55 people per day for medical care. During December, this was as high as 63. We're on track to refer approximately 31,000 individuals for medical treatment this year as compared to 12,000 last fiscal year. Since December 22nd, 2018, U.S. Border Patrol agents have spent over 57,000 hours at a hospital or medical facility. This equates to just under, 50, or just under 5,700 shifts of hospital watch during the 72 days at a cost of 2.2 million in Border Patrol salary. Between 2014 and 2018, MedPAR data has shown that we have spent $98 million uh, on medical services for indiv individuals in CBP custody. That's a quick background of what we have going on operationally. I'm proud of the professionalism uh, compassion our agents have shown during confronting this border security and humanitarian crisis. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the Commissioner McAleenan to speak more about the ongoing actions. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner Meehan, uh, for your briefings. Uh, welcome, everyone, today. Uh, it should be very clear uh, from these numbers that we are facing alarming trends in the rising volumes of people illegally crossing our southwest border or arriving at our ports of entry without documents. This increased flow presents currently at our highest levels in over a decade, both a border security and a humanitarian crisis, challenges our resources and personnel, and is negatively impacting border security. While Chief Hastings focused on the significant numbers of illegal crossings between ports of entry, where 87% of the total flow in February came, we're also seeing stark increases in asylum seekers as we work to provide lawful and safe access at our southwest border ports of entry. In fiscal year 2018, we saw a 120% increase uh, over fiscal year 17 with 38,000 claims at southwest border ports of entry. So far this fiscal year, we've seen a 90% increase over those record levels in fiscal year uh, 18 and fully 60% of inadmissible persons at our southwest border ports of entry are making claims of fear of return to their home country. Taken together, these numbers are remarkable. 76,000 total apprehensions and inadmissible arrivals in a four-week month in February. That's the highest number of encounters in any February in the last 12 years. Within that number, I just want to underscore, in 28 days, we had 40,385 encounters with family units and 7,250 encounters with unaccompanied children. That means we have apprehended and encountered more families in just five months and five days than last year's record total. Not only are the numbers increasing, the percentage of people from countries in the Northern Triangle of Central America has, has increased as well. Now 70% of all crossings are from these countries, and a full 62% of all crossings and encounters are vulnerable families and children. November of this fiscal year marked the first time that any other country exceeded the numbers of Mexican nationals apprehended and encountered by CBP. 
Guatemalans and Hondurans are both crossing now in larger numbers than Mexican nationals. These numbers are significant, as Chief Hastings explained, because unlike historical crossings, which are comprised of a large majority of single adult males from Mexico who could be repatriated quickly, families and children from Central America require increased care and processing and are released into the United States pending adjudication of their immigration claims. Within these numbers, we are confronting challenging new smuggling cycles, patterns, and methods. So-called caravans, where 500 or more migrants from groups in Central, form groups in Central America, mostly in Honduras, and travel together through Mexico to our southwest border. Separately, we see a new phenomenon highlighted on the screen of large groups of mostly family units from Guatemala who are traveling on buses through Mexico to the U.S. border in much shorter smuggling cycles, making the journey in as little as four to seven days and on a very consistent basis. So far this year, as Chief Hastings alluded to, we've seen more than 70 instances of groups over 100. In one case, agents encountered a group of 334 migrants. And smugglers are dropping these groups in the most remote areas of our border, including places like Antelope Wells, New Mexico, Ajo, Arizona, and Yuma, Arizona. The availability of these express bus routes means that more young children are arriving at our border, and we are seeing migrants arrive with illnesses and medical conditions in unprecedented numbers. To address these concerns, which were put into stark relief with the tragic deaths of two migrant children in December, CBP has mounted significant new efforts to increase medical checks and care upon arrival at Border Patrol stations or ports of entry. On December 25, 2018, I directed CBP to complete secondary medical reviews of all children in Border Patrol custody by either contract medical professionals or a CBP agent and officer trained as an EMT or paramedic. To sustain and formalize this work, on January 28th, I issued an interim medical directive uh, developed with advice from medical experts and pediatricians to guide CBP's deployment of enhanced medical efforts to mitigate the risk to and improve our care for individuals in CBP custody uh, as a result in these surges of children and families. Since the directive was signed with the help of interagency partners like the U.S. Coast Guard and Public Health Service, CBP has interviewed 27,000 juveniles and certified medical practitioners have screened over 12,000 more, transporting an average, as you heard, of 55 people to the hospital each day. We're going to make the, that procedure publicly available today, given the intense interest in our medical efforts uh, on the border. The Border Patrol's El Paso sector I want to highlight for a second because they've experienced these trends and these increases more acutely than any other place uh, along the border uh, new in this fiscal year. Uh, that includes uh, El Paso and about 40 miles south, uh, as well as all the way through New Mexico and the boot heel uh, extending toward the west. Uh, El Paso sector alone has seen a 434 percent increase in apprehensions this fiscal year. The ma vast majority are family units and UA unaccompanied children arriving in large groups, which uh, challenges their capacity in their facilities. Facilities housing migrants near El Paso have reached capacity and gone over capacity numerous times in this fiscal year in the first quarter, a situation that impacts both the efficiency of migrant processing and the quality of our care that we're able to provide for detained migrants. Uh, to help address this, we are taking steps to establish a centralized processing center, CPC, in the El Paso sector. This will help us protect the health and safety of families and children in custody while streamlining operations and reducing the time that we're holding families and children. Uh, the El Paso Central Processing Center will provide one location for the processing of family units and children in an appropriate environment and will facilitate consistent medical assessments in one location. I want to underscore a key point here. While our enhanced medical efforts and the creation of new facilities will assist with managing the increased flows, and while we'll continue to do all that we can to address these increases in traffic safely and humanely, the fact is that these solutions are temporary and this situation is not sustainable. Remote locations of the United States border are not safe places to cross and they are not places to seek medical care. The system is well beyond capacity and remains at a breaking point. Based on the experiences of men and women on the front line, this is clearly both a border security and humanitarian crisis. And we know what is driving these trends. These increases in traffic are a direct response from smugglers and migrants to the vulnerabilities in our legal system. These weaknesses in our immigration laws and accumulated court rulings now represent the most significant factors impacting border security 
and causing this humanitarian crisis. These include, first and foremost, the inability to keep families together while they complete expeditious and fair immigration proceedings. Instead, crossing with a child is a guarantee of a speedy release and an indefinite stay in the United States. The asylum gap, where approximately 80% of individuals meet the initial credible fear bar in the asylum process, while only 10 to 20% of Central Americans are found to have valid asylum claims at the end of their immigration court proceedings. And the disparate treatment under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which allows for children arriving from Mexico and Canada, contiguous countries, to be repatriated, but not children from other countries, including those in Central America, regardless of the position of those governments. No one knows these vulnerabilities better than transnational criminal organizations who are continually working to exploit vulnerable people in the Northern Triangle and the weaknesses in our system. The message from the smuggling organizations to parents in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador is clear. If you bring a child, you will gain entry to the United States and you will be allowed to stay. There are solutions to this crisis. We need to continue to support the governments in Central America to improve economic opportunities, to address poverty and hunger, and to improve governance and security. The administration announced $5.8 billion in aid and investment commitments in December. We must work with the new administration in Mexico on addressing the transnational criminal organizations that prey on migrants and incentivize this traffic. We must invest in border security, including a modern border barrier system, additional agents and officers, technology to screen vehicles, and air and marine support and we will put the investments in the fiscal year 19 appropriations bill to good use. But we also need, we also face an acute need for legislative action to address the gaps in the legal framework given the challenges I outlined here today. Every single day, smugglers and traffickers profit from human misery by exploiting people who are seeking a better life. Through human smuggling, transnational criminal organizations have established a new multi-billion dollar line of business the situation is not safe for migrants. It challenges our ability to provide humanitarian care. It contributes to dangerous conditions on our border and enables smuggling while enriching criminals. Regardless of anyone's preferred policy outcome, the status quo is unacceptable. It presents an urgent and increasing crisis that needs to be addressed. Thank you. We'll be happy to take some of your questions. Please. that is a higher priority than extending physical barriers at the southern border beyond what was already appropriated in fiscal year 19? I think we need to do both. Uh, we're facing both a border security and a humanitarian crisis. The, the vulnerabilities in the legal framework are creating the incentives for families and children to come to the border, while we still face significant numbers of single adults trying to evade capture and increase narcotic smuggling between ports of entry. That's what the border barrier system and the technology between ports of entry helps us address. So we absolutely need help on both sides. If I could just get a follow-up, which one do you think could be done faster? Well, if, if we could get bipartisan action uh, to address the, the crisis that we're outlining, uh, legislation could be completed faster. But we're also moving out very quickly on the border wall system. Uh, Quinn? I, these numbers are used as a proxy for the flows across the border, um, but how much of it could just be attributed to your agents having more resources and doing a better job of apprehending people as we build up certain uh, border barriers? Yeah, that's an important point. So our, our surveillance capability, uh, our ability to interdict those who do cross is at its highest level ever uh, in terms of a border security capability to identify and interdict crossings. Uh, and as you note, families and children are not trying to evade capture. They're presenting. So we're capturing just about all uh, folks who cross between ports of entry in terms of families and children. Uh, th that said, th we know that single adults continue to try to evade capture. We know that, that smugglers try to use the current flow on the humanitarian side uh, to bring in drugs and contraband. And we want to make sure we don't miss anybody. So we, we need that dual investment on the border security side and changes to help us on the humanitarian side. Um, as far as the migrant protection protocols, which in a call uh, last week they mentioned that it's going to extend to other locations along the border, how does the medical aspect of this um, uh, uh, factor into that? For example, if you have someone that comes and they have a medical uh, issue, uh, will you treat them the same and then will they be returned to Mexico or how will that play out? So on the medical side, 
having the ability to provide a certified medical practitioner for care at our major ports of entry is absolutely part of our medical expansion. It's not just for Border Patrol stations. Uh, we have that ability at San Ysidro. We want to expand it to places like El Paso, where we see a lot of migrants uh, arriving undocumented, uh, as well as Nogales and other places along the border. So if somebody comes in who's very ill, we, we will try to address that and, and treat them on arrival. Uh, what the migrant protection protocols will allow us to do is create additional access uh, for people that are seeking to present asylum claims or are undocumented, and then a dedicated court docket to hear those claims more exp expeditiously. Uh, last question. So with the numbers that you've seen in January and February, what is the expected forecast for the rest of the year? So it, typically we see seasonal increases in, in March, April, and May. Uh, the patterns that we're seeing right now are very similar to what we saw in fiscal year 14, which led to the first significant surge of families and children. So we're very concerned that we're going to see numbers continue to rise uh, into March, April, and May, especially with these new diversified offerings that smugglers are presenting uh, to bring families to the border more quickly. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, happy to follow up with anybody with any additional questions. Um, Again, the stats are going to be posted on at 2 o'clock, and uh, please do not hesitate to contact CBP OPA with any additional follow-ups. Thank you.